I'm Edie Lush and I'm here in the Hub Pavilion in Davos, very pleased now to be joined by Daniel Bell. You're a professor at two different universities in China and I want you to introduce that because that's relevant to one of the things right. you want to talk about. I'm a professor at Tsinghua University in Beijing and also at Jiao Tong University in Shanghai. And what's telling me about your latest research, your latest book? It's to do with the, our attachment to cities versus countries. Right. I mean, just as an empirical fact, I think many people today are more attached to their cities than, than to their countries. I mean, think of New Yorkers who are often more attached to New York than to the country as a whole. And it's true in many cities, too, in, around the world. So there is a strong sense of urban pride, but we don't have, so the emotion is that we don't have a good vocabulary to describe it. So, you know, when we, when we say love of country, we say nationalism or patriotism. But I love my city. I love New York. It's the most influential slogan in the world. Every city has this, I love whatever. But there's no word to express it. So we invented a new word called civicism. It's in the mm -hmm. book that I wrote with an Israeli friend, Amir de Shalit, called The Spirit of Cities. And, and we defend it. We say why it's better to be attached to a city than to be attached to a country. And why do you think it is better? Um, well, for one thing, you know, I think we, many of us have this need for communal attachment. So the question is, what's it going to be attached to? And if it's an attached in very strong form to a country, usually it means that there's another country that is kind of the other, and that could easily break out into dangerous forms in, in, mm -hmm. in war, in a worst-case situation. But if you're attached to a city, I mean, cities don't have their armies, you know, at least they won't go to war with each other. So I can say, I love Shanghai and, and I hate Beijing or vice versa, mm -hmm. or my friends from Israel. Many people love Jerusalem and hate Tel Aviv or vice versa, but it won't lead to social conflict. In fact, that sort of competition can be very mm -hmm. productive. I remember growing up in San Francisco, we always talked about how we didn't like the people from LA because they took our water. And then when I moved to right. LA, I loved it. <laughs> right, okay, right. So, so to have an identity, of course you want it to be grounded in something real, some sort of particular culture and history. But if it's defined against another city, which it often is, uh, it, it, it needn't be as problematic as when you, you have a love of a country, which is defined against another country. So that's one reason. But also, as, I mean, in China, many of the cities look the same now. And, and so there's this worry that globalization, it leads to homogenization. And it's really hard to be attached to a city that looks so much like any other mm -hmm. city. Just like it's hard to have strong pride in your neighborhood, McDonald's, right? So in, in, in China, in, and that's just one place, but many other places too, cities are one to affirm their particularity so that people can have a stronger sense of identity. Mm -hmm. So we think, on the one hand, it's important to love your city, but on the other hand, it's also important for that love to be grounded in a particularity, or what we call the ethos of the mm -hmm. city. You're based in China, and you've also had some thoughts about um, some of the social movement in China. Tell mm. me a little bit about that. Um, well, one, one of the clear trends in China, which is in the rest of the world you have this trend too, but it's happening more rapidly in China, is this trend towards urbanization. So again, people worry about this decline of a sense of community. Because until recently, the large majority of China lived, uh, people uh, lived in the countryside where you had towns and villages which had a strong sense of community. But now that's being displaced when they move into these big mega cities now. So now over half of Chinese live in cities. Um, so where is that sense of community going to come? If, if, it's, if they're not going to get it from the countryside, is it going to be projected onto the nation? That's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. so, so it's better that it be projected, to, so to speak, onto cities. You know, I mean, it sounds kind of manip manipulative, mm -hmm. but, it, but, it's, but we, you know, we do have this need for communal attachment. So we have to think about what it's going to be attached to. Mm -hmm. so, I think it, so that's one reason why this rise of what we call civicism, urban mm -hmm. pride, is important, not just in China, but elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And how does, the, how does um, Confucianism play a role in this, do you think? Well. Um, the Confucian uh, ethical system, it, it's grounded in this idea of graded love, which means that I begin by loving my family. I have more responsibilities towards my family, more attachments, and, but then I need to extend that love outside my family. But the more I extend it, the less the responsibility, the less the love. So this means that, in some sense, from a Confucian ethical framework, I should be more attached to my city than to my country, because the city is more concrete. I have more uh, attachments there, more responsibilities. So it's normal from a Confucian perspective that I'd be attached more to the city than, than to the country as a whole. Having said that, there are many debates in Confucianism or in mm -hmm. China now about how to reform the national political system and how Confucianism can play a role in that. And that's my other area of research. And, 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 we, and many critical intellectuals and reformers in China think that some sort of democracy with Confucian characteristics it actually works better than a pure Western form of liberal democracy. One more question. Tell uh, me a little bit about why that is. 
Well, because one problem with democracy is that it's, again, it's nation-centered. And even when democracies work well, the political leaders tend to serve the interests of voters and they neglect the interests of non-voters who are affected by the policies of the government. Like, think of future generations. Nobody represents future generations in, you know, in the U.S. or in Canada. But yet, what we do now is going to affect them, right? Think of climate change. Um, and, or nobody represents the interests of non-voters living outside the country who are affected by the policies of the government. Again, climate change is a good example. So Confucianism says, yes, the government needs to gain the trust of the people, but it should also represent all those who are mm -hmm. affected by the policies of the government. So there should be formal representation for future generations. The government should take a more long-term approach, not be subject totally to the whim of voters. Mm -hmm. And it should also be concerned with representing the interests of the world as a whole. So it sounds utopian, but... Ch it's incredibly it's, practical. Yeah, I mean, it's, and it sets a standard for political progress, which mm -hmm. is better than a pure Western-style form of liberal democracy. Absolutely fascinating stuff. I really thank you for coming thank into you. the Hub Pavilion here in thank Davos, you. and I'm Edie Vash.